So today I'm going to start lecture two, and this is going to be a video on the rotor. And again, this is part of our helicopter dynamics course. I'm Dr. Ranjan Ganguly. Now we see that if we look at conventional helicopters, you will find that they essentially have a set of blades. And these blades are typically placed at same distances around the rotor disc. They are all essentially same in terms of the material and geometric properties, and they are coming together at the rotor hub or the central hub. Now, one of the reasons why the blade should be all same as far as possible is to prevent any kind of tracking problem which can lead to vibrations. Now, in reality, the blades may be slightly different, but as far as possible, an effort is made to make them as similar as possible. Now, the blades rotate with a uniform velocity. Now, here there is a difference between helicopter rotor blades and wind turbines, for example, because wind turbines are being propelled by the wind and the wind varies in its speed. Therefore, the blades may rotate at different speeds at different time. But as far as helicopter rotors are concerned, here the rotational power is coming from the engine system and therefore it's coming from the shaft torque and therefore we can maintain a uniform rotation speed. So that is something which is used in the various derivations of helicopter equations and so on. Now you will see that helicopter rotors have a large diameter. If you look at any helicopter, if you go to an air show, you will see that the blades are very long, typically three to five to six meters in length. And one of the reasons why the helicopter blades are very long is that it is required to perform vertical flight as efficiently as possible. Later, we are going to show this mathematically, but that is one of the main reasons. One of the reasons is that you want to move a large mass of air with a very small velocity change. And this is accomplished by a large diameter rotor. The second thing you will see is that the aspect ratio of the blades is high. And here, aspect ratio would be the length divided by the cord. And again, this is also required because of the efficiency you can get in terms of the fluid mechanics properties for the rotating wing. Now, both these factors, which essentially come from performance and fluid mechanics, lead to blades which are considerably more flexible than what you see in propellers. So if you have ever seen the propeller type of vehicles, you will see these propellers are very small. They have high degrees of twist and so on. But the length of the propeller is of course very small. It's much more stiff related to the helicopter blades. So helicopter blades are extremely flexible. And this is one of the reasons why the structural aspects of helicopter greatly couple with the fluid mechanics parts. Now, because these blades are so flexible, you are going to have a substantial motion of the rotor blade. And this is going to produce large moments at the blade root. Now, these moments would be transmitted through the rotor hub to the fuselage and so on. Now, sometimes these moments are beneficial they can be good for helicopter control, for example, for a hingeless rotor, but they are bad for vibration. So essentially, the higher harmonic loads are going to be bad for vibration, and the lower ones are good for control. So that is a fact to keep in mind whenever you are doing a helicopter design problem. So let us take a look at the typical rotor blade. So one of the first concepts which came about, about how to fix this problem of high bending moment, was to introduce the flap hinge and the lag hinge. So here you see, 
this flap in here and essentially the helicopter blade performs a up and down flap motion around this flap hinge similarly there is a lag hinge here and the helicopter blade moves to and fro around this lag hinge here there's also something known as a pitch bearing and this plate is capable of pitching up and down in this direction around this particular axis known as the feathering axis so these three bearings are conceptualized in a basic concept known as the articulated rotor so that's the first type of helicopter which came about and this was a mechanical engineering solution to the problem of large bending moments so essentially you have the hub you have a typical flap hinge lag hinge pitch bearing and the blade has three motions flap lag and pitch now the bending moment is going to be zero at the blade hinge that is coming from your dynamics and mechanics of the system but in the vicinity of this zero point also the moments are going to be low throughout this root region of the blade and so in the case you have the flap hinge at the root the hub moments are not going to be transmitted to the helicopter but in reality you put the hinge at some offset from the hub so that some of these moments are transferred and you have some level of control capability on the body through the main rotor so in the classical solution the articulated rotor solves the problem of high bending stresses at the blade root by using the flap and lag hinge but as we can see that these flap and lag hinges would create a lot of mechanical complexity and in fact if you see the typical blades I would recommend that you go to an air show and check out the rotor blades you will see some of the older helicopter rotors are extremely complex near the hub and especially if you see the hinges you will see the source of the complexity so one of the aims of the hingeless rotor is to remove the flap and lag hinges by using a region of low flexibility near the blade root and this region essentially simulates a hinge this flexible region is also known as a flexure and one of the technologies which help to fructify this particular hingeless rotor concept is the use of composite material composite materials are different from the metals which were used before composites came in and essentially you have fibers which go through a resin and essentially these fibers strengthen a plastic type of situation so these kind of materials which are known as composites which essentially means that they are combined two different type of materials one which provides the strength to the structure that is the fiber and the second are the matrix component which are typically some kind of resins and different chemicals and essentially the composites are tailorable and because they are tailorable you can design this flexure to have a very low stiffness and effectively serve as a hinge without actually being a mechanical hinge so let's take a side way look at the helicopter rotor you have the axis of rotation the blades are rotating like this you have attachment point we can say that's a hinge here let's say a flapping hinge and then we call this particular angle by which it is flapping as beta the greek word beta and then this is known as the flapping angle sometime also referred to as coni so essentially the blade goes up and down like this now a further simplification can be made which is there in the bearingless rotor where you try to replace the pitch bearing also and the pitch bearing is replaced by a very flexible device known as the flex beam and this reduces the number of moving parts further even from a hingeless rotor 
and therefore it would reduce the maintenance cost and increase reliability. So this is a schematic of the bearingless rotor. Essentially, you have a flex beam, which is like a very thin beam, very complex to design made of advanced materials like composites. And essentially it lets this uh, blade flex around this particular location. You also have a torque tube through which the torque is transferred to the blade. So the effect of the bearingless rotor is that now you do not have a pitch bearing also. There are no more bearings present. And again, I should say composites have played a huge role in development of the bearingless rotor concept. In fact, you will find now that most tail rotors have bearingless concepts. Now, going back to the notational aspect. So if we take a side view of the rotor, this is the rotation speed. This is the hinge offset. The flap hinge is here. And so this angle is known as the flap beta. Now, if you take a top view of the rotor, you have the rotation here going like this. You have an offset of the lag hinge, and then the lag is given by zeta. So this is the lag motion. So the lag motion is going like this. So flap and lag motion are two key components of any rotor blade. And if you consider a hingeless rotor, essentially what happens is that the flap motion is very similar to what is known as out of plane bending. And if you have studied mechanics of solid or beam theory or structures, you know that beams typically move in a bending direction. So the bending motion of the beam is actually very similar to the flap motion. Now the lag motion is actually similar to what could be called in plane bending. Now, most of the time we don't study this concept in detail, but you can imagine the same beam can bend in the in-plane direction also. Then that would be the lag motion. Now, the pitch motion is typically used to control the rotor. And this pitch motion is used by the pilot to control the rotor. We are going to discuss this in greater detail later. Now, essentially through pitch, you can control alpha on the blade, the angle the blade sees with respect to the airflow, and therefore the aerodynamic forces which act on the rotor can be controlled. The aerodynamic forces being lift, drag, and pitching moment, of which lift is the beneficial one. So to take a side view of the blade, if we look at the blade cross section, it is an airfoil. And essentially this airfoil has a chord length given by C. There is a velocity coming in from front and you essentially have an angle alpha between this velocity and this chord line here. Now, the effect of this velocity coming on an airfoil section is that you have a lift and a drag. The lift is perpendicular to the velocity. The drag is parallel to the velocity. And there is also a pitching moment generated if you have a typical non-symmetric section. Now, essentially, we find that for subsonic flow, this lift and drag acts at the quarter chord point called the aerodynamic center. We are calling it AC here. So this distance is the quarter chord from the front of the airfoil section to this point is 1 by 4 into chord. So that's the basic side view of the blade. Now, what is pitch motion is that you are able to move this up and down. Now, this is very different from a typical aircraft or a fixed wing. Here, you are able to move this. The pilot is able to do that. And that is known as theta. So theta is the pitch motion. And theta can essentially control this particular variable here, alpha. On a hinged blade, the pitch bearing is typically outboard of the flap and lag hinges. On a hingeless blade, it may be inboard or outboard of the flexure. So these are some of the typical designs which are possible in terms of placement of the pitch bearing. Now let us look at some of the possible rotor concept. The articulated rotor, this has the blades fixed to the hub. There may be an offset also with flap and lag hinges. 
Now, in a teetering rotor, you have two blades forming a continuous structure, which are coming together at a rotor shaft with a single flap hinge. And this is a teetering or a seesaw type of situation. Pictorially, if you look at a teetering rotor, you're going to see one structure here. There is a flap hinge here. And this thing essentially moves up, moves down here, very similar to the seesaw you see in children's playground. So imagine two kids are sitting here and this is going up and down. So a teetering rotor is very similar to this. Very simple concept, but of course there would be some level of mechanical complexity because of the hinges. Now an extension of the teetering rotor concept is the gimbal rotor. Now here you have three or more blades. They are fixed to the hub. There is no hinge, but in lieu of the hinge, there is a gimbal or universal joint. And so some rotors actually use this gimbal rotor concept also. Now, of course, we have the hingeless rotor came about in the 70s and so on after composite materials started coming up. And here the rotor blades are attached to the hub, but there is no flap and lag hinge. That is why it's known as a hingeless rotor. Instead, as we saw before, we use a flexure or a region of very low stiffness. And the blades are fixed to the hub with the cantilever root restraint. So essentially, from strength of materials or from solid mechanics, the hingeless rotor can be modeled as a cantilever beam, a fact we are going to use in this course pretty frequently down the road.